Welcome to the Hospital Finance Podcast, your go-to source for information and insights that can help you stay ahead of the challenges impacting healthcare finance. And now, the host of the Hospital Finance Podcast, Michael Passanate. Hi, this is Mike Passanate, and welcome back to the Hospital Finance Podcast. Healthcare is always a major issue at the federal level. Today, I'm joined by Eric Rasmussen of the American Hospital Association for an update on what to expect from Washington this year. Eric works in the Federal Relations Department of the American Hospital Association as Vice President of the Advocacy and Public Policy Group. Eric is responsible for representing AHA's interests before the U.S. Congress. His primary goals are to promote hospitals' interests with primary congressional committees that have the greatest importance to hospitals. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's, uh, you've got a good crew uh, that listens to this podcast, so I'm, I'm happy to get a few minutes with you. Eric, we were talking before the show, and, and you had a um, rather ex- rather extensive presentation that you gave earlier this year looking at a, at a variety of federal issues. So um, we're going to go through just a few of them here on the show today because I know we could be on for, for quite a while if we did them all. Um, but why don't you start out hey, by giving us a brief – yeah, let's, why don't you start out by giving us just a brief overview of the 2020 congressional agenda and, and, and what they're looking at related to health care. Got it. So the congressional agenda is going to be dictated by two dates this year. Uh, by uh, May 22nd and by November 2nd. November 2nd, of course, is the presidential election. Everything's geared towards that. But uh, May 22nd is a less known date. At the end of the last Congress, um, the Congress thought they were pretty close on two big issues, on finishing legislation on surprise billing and on uh, drug pricing. And so they had a package of must-pass healthcare extenders, uh, things like Medicaid dish cuts, uh, funding for community health centers, and a number of other dogs and cats. And so rather than simply uh, date those things with the rest of the federal budget, which is through October 1st, they decided to to put those things on on a timeline of May 22nd, which provides a mid-year must-pass bill. Um, And as if you ever listen to Speaker Pelosi, uh, you've, you've learned that getting something to the U.S. Senate is very, very hard and frustrating. But this package has to get through the U.S. Senate by May 22nd. And so that's a different date than usually happens. And so because those must-pass things have got to get done by May 22nd, other things are going to get onto that train. And the Congress want, leaders in Congress want to get uh, surprise billing and drug pricing into that, or one or the other of those. They'd like to get both, but they may only be able to get one. And then there'll be... um, there'll be what I usually call ornaments on a Christmas tree because this stuff usually happens around Christmas time. Um, but it's near Memorial Day, so it's probably like crap to put in the back of your car for the family vacation. But other legislative uh, things get tacked onto a must-pass bill. And so there, there could be other things in the healthcare space that get added onto it. And there could be, um, if there are pay-for issues, if they've got to raise money, let's say they want to do something on surprise billing, but it'll cost money, then they've got to save some money somewhere else. So cuts could pop up in other areas. Um, and so that's the general agenda. Things are targeted through May 22nd. Um, and so with the president's budget coming out, uh, the dominoes are going to start to fall, and we're going to have a very busy next four months. Great. Let's uh, let's dive into some issues that are, are specific to hospitals that are, that are out there. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what might be coming related to Medicaid DISH? So Medicaid DISH... Um, that they delayed the cuts to Medicaid DISH through May 22nd. So as you may recall, Medicaid DISH, uh, it was kind of tied in the ACA to Medicaid expansion. Medicaid didn't end up expanding. And so we have gone to the Congress and said, hey, since Medicaid didn't expand everywhere in the way that you planned, these DISH cuts, like it's unfair to keep them going. Medicaid DISH is scheduled to get cut by $4 billion in 2020 and then by $8 billion a year in 2021 through 2025. So they um, were very glad that delaying of the Medicaid dish cut has gotten put into this extenders package where they got they realize they have to pass it. The issue is um, they can, I mean, it expires on May 22nd. So technically on May 23rd, the full Medicaid dish cuts are supposed to go into effect. No member of Congress wants to go to their local hospital, their, you know, their dish hospital and say, hey, you treat the poorest of the poor and the sickest of the sick. And we're going to cut you by hundreds of, you know, of millions of dollars. Um, and so we think that Congress 
wants to do the right thing both politically and because they do have a heart. Um, and so the challenge becomes, where does that money come from? And uh, making sure that that stays with that extenders package of must pass, that it doesn't fall out of the package. Okay, great. And what do you think might change around site neutral payments? That's been an issue for a little while now as well. Yeah. Yeah. Site neutral has been an interesting thing because um, it's site neutral is a pay for, or in other words, it's something that cuts spending. And so Congress can spend other things and members of Congress like spending things on things they like. Um, they're like a kid in the candy store. So uh, site neutral is something that you can also turn a dial on it. Um, so you can start with a small site neutral amount and then you can ramp it up. Um, and site neutral for, for listeners who aren't aware is there's the concept that you pay the same amount for a service regardless of what setting it's in. So for an ev evaluation and management or e &M visit, if you pay $30 for that in a doctor's office, it should be paid $30 in the hospital. Our opposition to that is, is because um, hospitals, all the, survey, all the uh, studies show, hospitals see the sickest of the sick. We see a sicker population, a poorer population. We see an older, our patients are more likely to be Medicaid uh, or Medicaid and Medicare dual eligibles. So, um, and we also see patients 24 hours a day. Um, and so like we see a more expensive patient and that's why Medicare in its wisdom over the years has said, we will pay a higher amount at hospitals and a lower amount in physician's offices. And part of that's also because doctor's offices literally have a third of the cost of ours in everything. Um, they only have to have the lights on from nine to five. We have to be open 24 hours a day. Uh, we have to have surgical suites and a hand specialist on call and ambulance services, all the things that make a hospital a hospital. And so site neutral cuts are, are challenging for us, like almost on an existential level, because they're saying, okay, hospital, we want to pay you like a physician's office. And we're not a physician's office. If, if you pay hospitals like a physician's office, you know what you'll get? You'll get a physician's office. Um, and you won't get all the things that we have decided that we want to have in this country. And so that's uh, the problem with site neutral generally. Um, what could change? They can always dial things up on site neutral. So uh, the president's budget's uh, out on February 10th. Um, last, year's last year's budget proposed making site neutral payment um, for more and more services. Um, currently, um, on-campus hospitals and outpatient facilities that were operating before December of 2015 get to retain that outpatient payment amount. Um, and the president has proposed changing that. Um, in fact, he tried to do it by regulation and we sued him and won. Um, and so we're always worried that more site neutral payment cuts could pop up in the budget or that Congress could turn a dial and raise, you know, three, five, 10, 20 billion, depending on what they need via various site neutral payment uh, changes. So it, it hangs like a specter over most must pass bills for us. Great explanation, Eric. Um, why don't we shift a little bit and talk about the election? I couldn't have you on without without looking at looking, <laughs> looking at something like that. Um, so Medicare for all, I, I know it's something that's been talked about a lot. Um, we've we've talked about it on the show before, um, and, and it's likely to get some more airtime as the election cycle heats up. Where do you, where are we at right now? Where do you think this is going? So we're what nine months from the election, um, and yeah, Medicare for all uh, is an interesting component um, of the debate. So uh, you know we're still because of Iowa um, kind of screwing the pooch. Uh, we, we haven't had the dropout that we've had that we usually have in a presidential election. So we're going on to, you know, New Hampshire and South Carolina. And so usually in a pres in a primary, both teams uh, go to the, the their wing areas. So Democrats campaign more liberally, Republicans campaign more conservatively, and they come back for the general to the center. Um, Medicare for all is, an, is I think, going to be part of that. The thing is that Medicare for all means different things to different people. If you look at the debate stage, um, you know, Medicare for all for Sanders and Warren truly means Medicare for all. Like it gets rid of private insurance, like it makes it illegal and everyone's in, it actually gets rid of Medicare too. And it get, puts everyone in a Medicare like system. Um, but then if you're Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg, um, Medicare for all looks a lot more like the ACA, 
um, it's uh, you know a public option standing alongside uh, the private pay. You can't, uh, and so and there's everything along that spectrum from from Warren to Buttigieg. Um, so in the elect, uh, but because Warren and, and Sanders have been around for so long, they're not going to tack back to the center the way a traditional presidential candidate does. So if Senators Sanders or Warren win the nomination, then I think the general is going to be a very clear dichotomy between um, a true Medicare for all, which is, again, private pay would be gone. So if you enjoy your Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, it's over. You're getting tossed into Medicare. Um, that versus President Trump and the, the vision he laid out in the State of the Union, which um, people may not agree with, but uh, he thinks that it, that healthcare is a winning issue if he's running against Sanders or Warren. If it's Biden or Buttigieg and they tack back to the, to the center of the political world the way most presidential candidates do, then I think healthcare becomes less of a big issue um, because you're tinkering with the relative edges rather than kind of overthrowing the entirety of, of, uh, of the healthcare world. Um, now we at the AHA, I should, and for full disclosure, we, we do not support, we oppose Medicare for all. Um, uh, and there's a million policy reasons, but the easiest way to explain it is healthcare is between one fifth and one sixth of the US economy. It's, it's a significant portion of what happens in this country. It would be less disruptive to, um, to, for the government to take over the TV film, automaking, and vacation industries and make that all government run. That would be less disruptive than taking over the healthcare system. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, we'd see massive layoffs. We'd see it would be uh, really, really life changing. That would be like saying you're moving to Mars next year. Uh, we don't know what we don't know about how crazy it would be. Yeah, it's certainly a, a huge, huge undertaking. Uh, let me tack back to something that you you, you touched on a minute ago because, you know, in, in a lot of the the surveys and, and the polls that, that I've seen and, and other guests that we've we've talked to about this, um, pretty consistently, healthcare comes up at the top of of voters' concerns. I mean, really, just above almost everything else. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how, how will the candidates ultimately re respond to that? Will they treat it with the same level of importance that voters do? Or, or do you think they're going to look for other issues to focus on? And, and this will be somewhere in the mix, but, but not at the top of their list as it is maybe for, for the voting public. Yeah, it'll be interesting. A, a lot of it'll, I think part of it will depend on what gets done by May uh, 22nd. Um, and I, I should mention in that May 22nd uh, rural issues, um, it's Senator Grassley who chairs the Senate Finance Committee. It's his last year's chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and he would like to get something done on rural health care. And I think and we would as well uh, on something that. Um, and so that's a priority that I didn't mention earlier. But that rural health issues will come up in the election for those rural states. Um, as you see, certain states that are more in play, like. Iowa, um, Ohio, uh, Arizona, Nevada, some of those purple states have got big rural areas. So that's going to be an issue. If rural stuff gets done by May 22nd, it becomes less of a presidential issue. If it doesn't, then it becomes a high issue. And then from there, you've got the big things. Um, and you can, you can almost see what, you know, from the president's State of the Union, because he does polling uh, before he goes and gives that speech what's going to pop up and surprise billing i'm sorry not surprise billing uh drug pricing is going to be a big issue um most americans are sick of paying high prices for drugs um and uh dr most don't can't fathom why a drug costs you know five thousand dollars a month for these little pills and so um i think that's going to be a big issue i mean you've got the the standard bearer of the republican party is saying we have to cut drug prices. He's saying essentially the same talking points that Nancy Pelosi has. So um, I, I think it's gonna be an issue during the campaign where people are gonna want uh, that to get done. Uh, they're gonna want to elect people who care about uh, like that actual healthcare pocketbook issue. Um, and then other things to expect, I think 
it's going to be interesting to see how Medicare for all plays out based on who the Democratic nominee is. Um, I think we've seen some of the messaging that the president's going to probably have. He's going to call anything like Medicare for all socialism. And so I think that'll be a fairly black and white uh, type of debate, uh, even if it uh, shouldn't be. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think both, it's going to be interesting because I think both sides will focus on healthcare because they both think it's a winning issue. It's been, which is unique. If you look at the 2010 election, Republic, right after the ACA, Republicans focused on healthcare because it was a winning issue for them. People were concerned about the ACA. They didn't know what was going to happen. They'd had a success with the Tea Party movement in the summer of 2010. And then, boom, Republicans take 66 seats in the House, like a historical uh, uh, wave. And then Democrats in 2018, they go out and they talk about, oh, those Republicans, they wanted to repeal your protections on pre-existing conditions. So they made 2018 about health care. Now, that's debatable. 2018, that election was probably more about Donald Trump. And the coming election is probably more about Donald Trump. But um, uh, they're both, but because both Democrats and Republicans think health care is a winning issue for them in 2020, that's going to be the biggest proxy war between Trump and whoever he runs against. Um, and especially if it's uh, one of the senators, Sanders or Warren, it's going to be a real, real different uh, policy debate. Um, and so it's going to be fascinating either way. Uh, and healthcare is going to come up a lot either way. Um, and so, you know, buckle in, folks. It's going to be it's going to be a good one. You bet. And we'll be looking forward to May 22nd then and, and seeing what the first steps are here um, as we look at healthcare in 2020. Um, Eric, great conversation. Uh, I did want to ask you where listeners can go if they'd like to learn more about AHA and, and what you do with regard to advocacy and public policy. Well, uh, so the AHA.org uh, website is a great uh, place to go to for, uh, for all of our stuff. But um, you can follow us on Twitter uh, or on Facebook. Um, I don't know if we have a Snapchat thing yet, but uh, we'll get there eventually. But um, so, uh, yeah, follow us on Twitter um, and uh, and you can find our things on AHA.org. We also put out a, a daily uh, AHA news every day. And so if your folks aren't getting that, just ask someone. They can call up the Friendly Neighborhood uh, AHA outpost and we can get them signed, signed into that. Or some of their facilities probably already getting it. Um, and so that's the easiest way is just have that email pop into your inbox. It takes 60 seconds to read at the end of every day. And that tells you what's going on in the hospital space. So that would be the easiest thing to do. Just get on that email list for AHA News. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And we have our annual meeting coming up in April. And so if folks haven't registered yet, please go and register for the AHA annual meeting. Um, I, I like working for the hospitals because it's like uh, it's working for a bunch of do-gooders. So it's fun to see everyone in April. So thanks for having me and I'll talk to you next time. If you have a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the Hospital Finance Podcast, or if you'd like to be a guest, drop us a line at update at Bessler.com. This concludes today's episode of the Hospital Finance Podcast. For show notes and additional resources to help you protect and enhance revenue at your hospital, visit Bessler.com forward slash podcasts. The Hospital Finance Podcast is a production of Bessler. Smart about revenue, tenacious about results.